All right, everyone. Uh, after that wonderful introduction into Choreo by Kanchana, we are going to uh, deep dive into most of the detailed stuff. So for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to take you around APF first engineering and how Choreo is going to help that. I'm Tishan Dhanayak again. I'm, asso I'm associate director and architect at WSO2. I joined WS2 like a decade before, and then I joined for the event processing team, then moved into the API manager stuff, and then currently I'm working as the team lead for API first engineering. So uh, without further ado, let's start the talk. Uh, so I'm going to take you through what is API first engineering, how to do it, what are your benefits, and then very briefly touch up on how WS2 Corio is going to help you achieve API first engineering in your organization. Um, for more information about Corio, you can come and meet me after the session. I'm going to briefly touch up on that only. But we are going to more focus more on API first principles. So let's look at the definition of what is API first engineering. So um, this comes from some of the industry experts and based on our uh, experience as well. API-first engineering is a strategic approach that centers on the API, treating APIs as first-class products, which are designed, implemented, distributed, and maintained by developers for developers, such a way so that API customers can build software applications, services, or wide IT systems by calling these APIs. Uh, reference to Bernadette Nixon of CEOs at Algolia and Tanya Velovic, who is head of engineering institute, who uh, influenced this definition. So point to note is treating APS as first class product. It is not your backend for your application or whatever that you're building. It's a product on its own merit. And I especially love this um, quote by Tanya, a product by developers for developers. How much of us think about when developing our APIs? We are developing another product for other developers. So API first engineering in its own merit is a, a different mindset that we want to develop around our organization in order to achieve that. So before looking at how to do uh, API first engineering, let me talk a bit about how not to do API first engineering. So uh, you in the audience might be wondering, OK, so when you are doing projects, we design our API for specification. Then we build our code around it. We upload the API definition into um, our wiki, Confluence, Google Drive, or whatnot. We keep it there. And then um, we host our API, and we serve the traffic. I, am, I think I'm doing API first engineering. It is a good starting point. But that is not what is all about API first engineering. Let me uh, give a quick example. So uh, when you have API definition stored away like that, uh, away from the runtime, something what might happen is uh, uh, with time, your API definition might be outdated from the actual runtime. Right? Simple things. You might have a query parameter that you introduce. You have, do, do not have that in your API definition, right? But how that works? So I'm, I'm talking about internal APIs mostly, the APIs that you use within your organization or the public exposed run. Public exposed monetized APIs, if you made a mistake, your customers will be calling you, so you will don't know that. But 70 to 80% of the APIs that you guys develop are internal APIs. So when that happens, what, uh, what is the reaction within the organization? Whoever uses that uh, find it hard to use the API because they don't know the query parameter. They find the author, come to their cubicle and ask, mate, I can use this. What to do? And they will reply, OK, we have this new query parameter. Go ahead and do with it. It works, right? Within, the tight within a small organization, that works. That means your API works, but you have outdated API definition there sitting alone. So we have a core term for this in the, at WSO2. We call this Machang protocol. So Machang is a local word that we use that sits above the first name basis. 
someone who is closer to you than the first name basis is a machang in our local language. So we call this that because you talk among your friends and figure this out. So inside your organization, if when you are consuming internal APIs, if you fall back to the machang protocol, that means you are not doing APFS correctly. So with that, let's look at how to do APFS engineering correctly. I'm going to uh, give you five guidelines. Uh, and let's quickly look up on them. First thing is, obviously, design your API as a product. Think of it as a, uh, the, in the same way that you uh, look at a physical product. First thing, so I'm going to look at four points. First thing is improve product market fit. So this is, as I said earlier in the definition, it is a product for developers by developers. Think whether does it offer enough functionality for your users? Uh, does it give out proper messaging? Also, when developing for the first time, do not only think about the single consumer that you have now. Think about all the future consumers. Think about your product market fit as you would do in a physical product. Second thing, treat as a primary user interface. When you are developing your applications or whatnot, uh, your GUI or your voice interface or your CLI, all of them will be using your API. So if you think about it, your API is the actual the interface for your uh, underlying data or the functionality system. So give it the importance that you're giving when designing your GUI or the CLI. Treat it as the, as the uh, first class user interface. Then the next thing I'm going to highlight is maintainability from uh, the provider's perspective. So an example from the physical world is a uh, few years ago, uh, Tesla had an issue with the autonomous driving system that they need to fix. They did a recall. In the normal sense, when you automobile maker do a recall, you have to take your vehicle to authorized garage, and they do the modification and give you the, back the vehicle. But what Tesla did was they, over there, halted the feature, ship, uh, ship the patch over there, and make it available. It's very uh, convenient to the user and the provider as well. You should try to do the same with your APS as well. You should try to think, how can I maintain my API? How can I patch my API without affecting my consumers? Uh, can I proactively identify uh, what are the errors and treat them? And the fourth point is debuggability. This is from the consumer's point of view. So again, another example from the physical world, I think uh, if you take a PC when it's booting up, before the operating systems and the IOs initialize, you have the, this bio code, right? I think all of us are old enough to know the bio code. So it's got beep, beep, uh, some beeping patterns to see if there is an error. Think about the mindset of the designers, right? Even before your IO is initialized, if there is a problem, they, are, they have thought about letting you know what exactly the problem is, whether your RAM is out, whether your video card is out. What is the benefit of that? If it says your video card is out, take out the video card, clean it, put it back, it works. It saves you a trip back to your uh, technical provider, right? Same with the API. Let's say you have a field, uh, you have a parameter called date, and you are expecting ISO format. User sends something else, you send the 400 bad requests, that's it. Then the user doesn't know what actually went wrong. But if you send exactly in the payload, we are expecting ISO this format, then you save the time of the user. They don't have to go into your Slack or Discord or whatever channel. They can fix it on their own, even if it is an internal user. So those are the four things when designing API as a product. And the next uh, point is adhering to, sorry, adhering to uh, foundational design. First thing I want to talk about is being implementation independent. Everyone says this. So your API should be there to expose data and functionality of the product, 
not the underlying technology. The underlying technology should not drive your API. It is, you should always think, I'm trying to expose a set of data or functionality, uh, and my API is trying to do that. Because underlying technology will uh, evolve very faster. When I joined the industry, the Java version was Java 7. Now it's 22, right? It's evolving pretty rapidly. But think about the system that you have been developing. They have been around for centuries, and functionality is almost going in the same thing, right? So you have to make your API implementation independent. The second point is holistic API-centric architecture. You have to think about the architecture of your organization in a holistic way. This is where the domain-driven design and then the cell-based architecture that Asanka was talking about come in. You need to uh, design uh, APIs of your organization, the utility APIs which provide basic functionality, domain APIs which are specific to domains, providing each of the domain specific functionalities, HR domain, marketing domain, finance domain, whatnot, and then the experience APIs which are actually exposed, which provide different, different digital experience to your consumers. So in both the topics I'm not going to talk much further. Uh, we have uh, Vo Vernon in the conference with us, who is like a renowned author on domain driven design. He'll be talking about that tomorrow, cell based architecture. Lakmal here is doing a, a session tomorrow. You can uh, use those. And then the other point I want to touch upon is reusability. So, when you do domain driven design or cell based architecture, when you have these domain APIs and your utility APIs, you are inheriting reusability. Because next time you want to do something, you have the building blocks in place. But you have to think about reusability in um, another spec, like when you are designing your API, you have to make it generic enough. Don't think about the single consumer that it has today, but think about all the consumer that it can have. Convert your assumptions in your API into configurations. Your assumptions make your APIs opinionated. The moment you convert them into configurables, you make your API generic. With that, moving on to consistency. So again, a real-world example. A major fruit-based beverage company here in the US did a packaging change somewhere back. With that, after that rebranding packaging change, they noticed that their sales were down by an uh, oddball of 20%. Because their consumers were confused. When they go ahead and look at the shelf, the, the cartoon that they were so used to was not there. Now they are evaluating what's out there. How does this apply to APIs? You have to maintain standards and patterns in the API world. There are two things. One thing is industry st standards. Like in terms of REST APIs, you have to make sure you are adhering to, you know, get this read, post it, create, things like that. If you jumble that up in your API, your consumers are going to get confused. Then the domain standard, whatever the domain that you're operating on, you have to use the standards, wording, and everything that is there. Or else, when, you, when someone from the domain look at your APIs, read your definitions, they're going to get confused. Then uh, same taxonomy and vocabulary that is within your, organi that is within your organization. So as an example, uh, uh, domain driven design solves this problem for some uh, level because you have domain objects when you're doing domain driven design so that you share the same object everywhere. But also taxonomy. If you're having multiple APIs, in one API you shouldn't call them a user and then other API you shouldn't call that a rider. In both places it should be the same uh, vocabulary that you'll be using because it will be intuitive for the uh, user. So the fourth point on making uh, API first, your organization API first is composing descriptive, reliable documentation. We all love documentation, right? We all do it, but we don't compose descriptive, reliable documentations. First thing is API specification. The same example I told earlier. You have a field called date. Description you put, date of the uh, created order. That doesn't make any sense. You had to put. Date of the created order in this ISO format, uh, your date should be within this range, 
and all whatever your preconditions are. Else, users can't use that. And then standards and patterns also apply to the documentation as well. Use the same naming, same standards within the uh, full documentation of your uh, products or the APIs. Else, your users are going to be uh, confused. And then have different docs for different purposes. Step-by-step -step guides. Demos and examples when it matters. And for complex problems, have solutions, right? Rather than one thing, have a solution document. So like that, you have to make sure your documentation is descriptive and reliable if you are going to make your organization API first ready. Final point is improve discoverability. Now you have an API designed as product. You have your documentation ready. Everything is perfect. But now your consumers have to find your product. That is where discoverability comes in. The first point is marketplace. Whatever the platform that you're using should offer you a marketplace that is able to, uh, makes you able to filter your products, make it searchable by name, by operations, by content of the API definition, whatnot. And then also add customizations to that. Add your own metadata and tags, right? give a sense of customization. Uh, now you can find it. The next point is ease of use. How easy can you use your API once you find it? So the usage part should be seamless, either documentation or some mechanism. The users, the developers are the users. They should be able to seamlessly use the API that they found. So that concludes us that the five things, five guidelines that we at WSO to put forward if, uh, that we think would make uh, your organization API first. And then I'm going to quickly touch upon why you should do API first engineering. You know what it is? What are the benefits uh, that it has onto your organization? I'm going to talk, not going to talk much about the benefits, but let's start from the very obvious one. It's going to give you improved developer experience and productivity. Why? With the API and discover marketplace and discoverability, you can uh, easily find what you want to do. And if there are building blocks that are already there, you are going to reuse it. You're going to find it better. And then with ease of use, without any asking around, without much on protocols, you can go ahead and use it. It saves you time. Uh, so with developers, right, we, we, most of us evolved from developers who we are today. We know how important our focus time is. The amount of work that we da get done in a focus time is tremendous, but the moment you get out of your focus zone, the effort that it takes you to get back onto your focus zone is too much. You get a chit chat here, coffee here, coffee there. So if you can make your organization, the, the, the process so seamless that the developers are not getting off their seats and seamlessly wiring it up. It improves the productivity a lot. And also, they can then focus on driving the actual value for your enterprise. Rather than thinking about what this core parameter does, they're actually delivering the application that your end user, the consumer, needs. So this is a very obvious uh, benefit. I'm going to talk about two oddballs in benefits. Uh, one thing is enhanced API security. What does API first have to do with security? So because we are doing holistic API designs, now you have uh, proactive security measures from the design itself. You have your utility APIs. You have your domain APIs. Then only you have your experience APIs. So you know where your functionality are. And then based on that, you can have your policies in place to protect them. You can have uniform security policies across organizations because of the holistic uh, API architecture. And also, if you practice consistency everywhere, those policies are going to be uniform across your organization. And the other fact is you are going to have a reduced attack surface. Why? Your utility APS, domain APS sits below. You only your experienced APIs are now exposed to the public sector, which is vulnerable. That means the attack surface that someone can 
try on is less. And when someone else is developing a new application, they are not going to put another API, which is public exposed, directly consuming your data. They're going to reuse this experience API or the domain APIs so that uh, you are, over the time, uh, in your, any expansion, you are keeping your security in check. And the third one, another ball, better compliance and governance. How? Again, holistic APIs entry architecture. You know where your entry paths are. You can define uh, in organization-wide policies because of the consistency. Uh, because you know your data access points, uh, you can have clean audit trials. As Isabel said in the morning, if you want to enforce security, we know where to enforce. We know the only point where the uh, public traffic enters. We can enforce the security there. So with API first, you can bake in governance, and you can bake in security. These are two oddball benefits that you, you get. So with that, I'm going to quickly touch upon what Corio brings to the table. Not going to go in details. If you want anything, I'll be sitting there around with my laptop. Come around, I'll show you with a demo. First thing is, we have this uh, cell-based architecture uh, by design. So you can have projects representing your uh, different domains. Within that, you can have your different services or APIs. So with that, uh, you can uh, get your holistic API architecture going. Next, we have a marketplace where you can search based on your name, uh, description, or the content of your definition. And you can filter based on the network visibility, whether it is a project level service, or organization level service, or a public service like that. And we even do have, as Sanjeev uh, uh, unveiled, uh, API chat to search the marketplace. What are the APIs? I want to develop something like this. Do you have APIs for that? Things like that. And then for any given service, we have this thing. When you deploy a service in Corio, if you provide your API definition, we show that in the marketplace, but we make sure that is the runtime API definition that you have. The gateway will only honor this definition. When you go into marketplace and search up your API or service, we'll show the same API definition here. Then again, you have overview, how to use guide and related documentation. How to use guide is populated automatically. Overview and related documentation users have to currently give through the console. But we are working on features where we would get the readme of your repository, put it as the overview. And you can put some MD files in your repository, link it with that uh, YAML file that earlier showed. And then related documentation will be also populated from the repository. So we are going to make it seamless for you to maintain your documentation in one place with the code in the repository, which will be shown in the marketplace. And Next point is uh, making new connections. Also, this is about ease of use. Now, we find your service, how we are going to use this. So we have this concept of connections. When your service A wants to use service B, from service A, you can go ahead and search the marketplace, find the service that you want to use, B. Say, create a connection for this. You provide a name. We do the, all the internal magic. And we give you, this is your connection. These are the values of your connection. For use this in your component, you have to do this, this stuff. We go, even go into the lens saying, if service A, if you know that the language is, let's say, Go, the code segments that we provide will be in Go language. If service A is Java, the code segments that we provide in the uh, developer guide on the other hand will be in Java. We go into that lens to make it easy for the developers to use your API. With that, uh, those are the features that I want to touch upon. As I said earlier, come and talk to me if you need more things. I'm going to finish with this code by Martin Fowler. Any fool can write code that computer can understand. Good programmers write code that humans can understand. The synonym of that, that to API first engineering is any fool can write an API that computer can understand and pass. But good programmers will only write APIs that humans can understand and use. With that, I'm going to. Um, Stop and time for any questions.